three months ago when we started to read the Heart of the Lotus Sutra. <coughs> My friend, Mr. Kian Tik Lee, Mr. Lee, so I always refer to Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee's been watching these videos for several years. Mr. Lee's not an SGI member. He's not somebody that practices at this time, although I don't know, maybe he has chanted some Daimoku since he started watching our videos, but he's been watching our videos for several years. He's a, uh, you know, a traditional Mahayanist uh, as it relates to what he believes in, so his whole background and understanding of the doctrines that we discuss always has that Mahayana kind of uh, uh, flavor to his understanding, and then he's constantly asking questions, trying to qualify what's Nichiren's teaching and the Buddhism of the sewing versus what he knows about Mahayana Buddhism, right? So um, I don't read these comments all the time because I'd have to constantly go back. People watch the videos on YouTube and they leave comments and it could be something, a video that I didn't, that we did several months ago. So, but this, this specific question, Mr. Lee is, asks questions all the time. I don't respond to all of them, Mr. Lee. I'm responding to this one because I think it's something that I want to share. But Mr. Lee says uh, on, uh, from the 181122 uh, uh, segment on, on YouTube, <clears throat> he says, what does earthly desires is enlightenment actually means? I want to hear it from you, please. And when Mr. Lee said that, I understood exactly what he was saying. He didn't want me want to hear, you know, a version of somebody else's explanation. He wanted to know what does that mean to you as a practitioner? Mm -hmm. What does, you know, how do I get my head around hearing this concept, earthly desires, which is the opposite of what my Mahayana Buddhism is telling me? Okay, I need to I need to purify my yeah. my life, right? Mm -hmm. So and, and that really, that's actually to a degree Hinayana Buddhism. But once again, if we took a look at any religious belief, almost all of them are based on uh, accepting a level of conformity to do's and don'ts. Okay, uh, We have the Ten Commandments in Christianity, and I know Islam has a bunch of stuff that you cannot do, and those sorts of things. The, you know, the... the, the the Daishonas Buddhism is really based on the precept of the diamond chalice. There is only one precept. There's only one rule. That's to keep chanting Daimoku with faith in the Gohonza and in the teaching of the Daishonin throughout your life. Okay? So before we read the actual Gosho, uh, 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 earthly desires are enlightenment, which he says it's not equals, it's our, in our enlightenment. I went through and just picked out a bunch of things from the dictionary that I thought were important for us to cover from an explanation standpoint to really uh, perceive uh, exactly what we're talking about. So where does the concept of earthly desires equals enlightenment, our enlightenment come from? It's great concentration and insight, basically. It's Tentai's teachings, okay, where, this, where that, that phrase actually initiates itself. So. I'm going to go through, because I don't have this in any order, I'm just going to flip through and read about eight or nine uh, 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 dictionary definitions to make sure that we understand. Okay, so earthly desires equal enlightenment. Where do you see that every day of your life? On Gohonzo. On the Gohonzo. Thank you, George. Where does it say it on the Gohonzo? On the right-hand side. On the left, uh, on the left hand side. <laughs> okay, oh, sufferings yeah. of birth and death are nirva oh, yeah. nirvana are on the right, as we face it. <laughs> as the Gohanza looks out at us, yes, it's on the right-hand side. Okay, so um, it's, 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 it's actually a very key aspect of the teaching of Nichiren's Buddhism. And that's why I wanted to discuss it, because we actually experience this in the course of our life. This is the evolution of going from being a common mortal to being a Buddha as far as I'm concerned. Understanding this concept for what it is and how it ultimately uh, affects you. So, uh, just let me read about what the characters on the Gohonza. Uh, while all other figures on the Gohonza are re represented in Chinese characters, the names of the Wisdom King Craving Filled and the Wisdom King Immovable are written below Virashvana and upholder of the nation, respectively, in Siddham, a medieval Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit script. 
Here the, uh, the wisdom king craving filled represents the principle that earthly desires are enlightenment and the wisdom king immovable, the principle of the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana, okay? So that's the whole thing. Those two concepts are tied together, right? All right, so uh, let me go on from that part of discussing the Gohonza. So the sufferings of birth and death in our nirvana is a, a reflective reality to the concept of earthly desires are enlightenment. Do you understand? They go hand in hand. They're saying the same thing, essentially. Okay? So making sure that we all understand what nirvana is, because what's literally nirvana pertain to? Hinayana Buddhism, ultimately. Generally, that's where it's, because it means blown out, right? It means eliminating all desire. That's the whole point of, that's the blown out point. You've, 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 you've severed all your attachments, okay? That's when you become nothing. That's the goal of Hinayana Buddhism, is to escape the sufferings of birth and death by not having a birth or a death anymore. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. All right, so... And you, get, and you get there by eliminating all attachments because attachments arise to causation give, and causation is what gives rise to existence and existence what is what gives rise to suffering, right? Mm -hmm. So nirvana, enlightenment, the ultimate goal of Buddhist pra practice. So the Gohansa says the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana or enlightenment. Sufferings of birth and death are, are enlightenment. Uh, just like we, this says earthly desires are enlightenment. Okay, does everybody understand where I'm coming from? Mm -hmm. To some degree? Okay, let me try and make it more clear as I go along. All right. Enlightenment, the ultimate goal of Buddhist practice. The, the Sanskrit word nirvana means blown out and is variously translated as extinction, emancipation, cessation, uh, quiescence, and or non-rebirth. Nirvana was originally regarded as the state in which all illusions and desires, as well as the cycle of birth and death, are extinguished. So you're, you're, you would no longer have existences if you reach nirvana, according to Hinayana Buddhism, right? Mm -hmm. Hinayanists distinguish two types of nirvana. The first is that of the arhat, who has eliminated all, illusion, all illusions and will no longer be reborn in the sixth past, but who will still be bound in the world of suffering as in that he possesses a body. This is called the nirvana of remainder or incomplete nirvana. The second is that which the arhat achieves at death when both body and mind, the sources of suffering, are extinguished. This is called the nirvana of no remainder or complete nirvana. Because Hinayana Buddhism teaches that the ultimate goal of practice can only be achieved at death, it was called the teaching of reducing the body to ashes and annihilating <laughs> consciousness. <laughs> Mahayanists criticize the practice directed toward this goal as escapist and indifferent to the salvation of others and probably derogatively coined the above phrase, uh, you know, Hinayana, this means lesser vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. In Mahayana Buddhism, Nirvana came to mean, in Nirvana, so in Mahayana Buddhism now, mm -hmm. Nirvana came to mean not so much an exit from the phenomenal world as an awakening to the true nature of phenomena or the attainment of Buddhist wisdom. So we must understand that when it says the sufferings and, of birth and death and nirvana, it's not talking about Hinayanist, we're talking about Mahayanist nirvana or Buddhahood. <coughs> even in the Mahayana, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, right. Yeah. Even in the Mahayana sutras, however, this attainment is regarded as requiring the elimination of earthly desires. Even in Mahayana Buddhism, because that was the whole point. You would purify your life as you practice diligently through whatever the Mahayana's teachings, and you were constantly trying to be reborn in that uh, pure land in the East, right? right? So you would always be re reborn in a pure land in order to attain Buddhahood, even with traditional Mahayana's thinking, right? So you had to go through, it still had to go through a purification process of eliminating your earthly desires. Now, how are you going to earthly, eliminate earthly desires? That's the whole point. That's why nobody attained Buddhahood this way. All right? That's why they had to die <laughs> with a promise that they would in the future because they didn't get there in this lifetime right. on that basis. Mm -hmm. All right? Because you cannot eliminate your earthly desires and stay alive. Mm -hmm. You understand? You don't have a craving to eat as minimum. All right? Mm -hmm. Sleep. All those functional things. Forget sex or drugs or rock and roll. Okay? Those kinds of earthly desires. We have earthly desires in all forms. Everything that we do is predicated on that. Why do we desire Buddhahood? It's really to, it's, that's an earthly desire. The desire for Buddhahood is an earthly desire. 
We don't even know what it is, but we desire it. We want it. We want the freedom from suffering mm -hmm. with the empowerment of our life, right? That is a desire. We haven't achieved it yet. We haven't experienced it yet. It's something that we want, okay? It's something that we're working toward. So it says, uh, even in my Sutras, however, this attainment is regarded as requiring the elimination of earthly desires in the same manner as expounded in the Hinayana teachings. So it's, they're almost the same as far as what you had to do. Therefore, it is taught that nirvana requires an immeasurably long period to achieve. Lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes. It's only in the Lotus Sutra that it's revealed you're already the Buddha. You don't have to become the Buddha. These were all processes that one would take on in order to achieve Buddhahood because it was something that didn't exist in your nine worlds. Okay, it's not until Tantai's teaching that we get into 3,000 realms in a single moment of life and the concept that the tenth <coughs> world exists equally in all the other nine, right. that we have the ability to attain Buddhahood in our present form. That's what we're trying to get to as I read all this. That's the difference between Nietzsche and Buddhism and everything else, okay? Buddhism is sowing, Buddhism is harvest. Buddhism harvest is, see you next lifetime. Buddhism is sowing is, get your shit together now and do it now. This is why you came to earth now, mm -hmm. all right? In contrast, the Lotus Sutra teaches that by awakening, awakening to one's innate nature, Buddha nature, one can reach the state of nirvana in his or her present form as an ordinary person who possesses earthly desires and undergoes the sufferings of birth and death. It reveals the principle that the sufferings of birth and death are none other than nirvana. From the standpoint of the Lotus Sutra, birth and death are two integral phases of eternal life. Nirvana, therefore, is not a cessation of birth and death, but a state of enlightenment experienced as one repeats the cycle of birth and death. The sufferings of birth and death and nirvana or enlightenment are inseparable. It is not necessary to extinguish one in order to attain the other. These sufferings belong to the nine worlds and nirvana to the world of Buddhahood. These, the nine worlds and the world of Buddhahood are mutually inclusive. That's the whole concept of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, right? By manifesting the state of Buddhahood, one enjoys nirvana while repeating the cycle of birth and death, okay? Then what did I want to read here? I wanted to read to you, who is this Gosho written to that we're going to write, read? It's, it's Shijo Kingo. And the reason that I want to bring up Shijo Kingo specifically again is that out of everybody that was a disciple of Nietzsche, and Shijo Kingo is the ultimate example of the behavior that we should try to emulate because his behavior was based on profound, profound and deep trust and faith in the Daishonin's teaching. I mean, let's, let's, let's think about it. You know, I'll, I'll read his whole history here. Shijo Kingo, a follower of Nietzsche who lived in Kamakura, Japan. His full name and title were Shijo Nakataka Saka Saka Waka. He's a very long name. Norimoto. Kingo is an equivalent of the title uh, Samanojo. His wife was Nichiginyo, and they had two daughters, Tsukimaro and Kyo'o. As a samurai retainer, he served the Ima family, a branch of the ruling Hojo family. Kingo was well versed in both medicine and the martial arts, and in temperament was straightforward, loyal, and passionate. He is said to have converted to Nichiren's teachings around 1256. So I think this Gosha is going to be like 1270 something. So he was about a 15, 16 year member when Dai, the Daishonin wrote this Gosha to him. He says, um, he is said to have converted to Nietzsche's teachings around 1256 at about the same time as uh, uh, Kudo Yoshitaka and the brothers Ikigami Muenaka and uh, Ikigami Muenaga. When Nichiren was taken to Tatsunakuchi to, to be beheaded in 1271, Shijo Kingo accompanied him, resolving to die by his side. After Nichiren was exiled to Sato Island, Shijo Kingo sent a messenger to him with various offerings. Through this messenger, Nichiren entrusted Shijo Kingo with his treatise, The Opening of the Eyes, which he had completed in the second month of 1272. A few months later, Kingo himself made the journey to Sato to visit Nichiren. So he was there when he was ready to be killed. He was, re he was there to protect him at every step of the way. He, went, he saw him in Mount Minobu. He saw him on Sato Island. I mean, this was a disciple, okay? Sometimes at, sometime after Nietzsche returned from Sato and moved to Minobu in 1274, Shijo Kingo tried to convert his lord, Emma, who was a believer in the Pure Land Jodo school and a follower of the priest Ryokan of Goryakuji Temple. 
Lord Emma did not take kindly to his retainer's belief in the Lotus Sutra or support of Nitrin, whom Ryokan hated, and harassed him on that account. At one point, he ordered Shijo to abandon his faith in Nitrin's teaching, threatening to transfer him to the remote province of Ichigo if he did not obey. In 1277, Shijo Kingo happened to observe a debate at Kuwatsugayatsu uh, in Kamakura in which Samibo, a disciple of Nitrin, defeated Ruzobo, a Tendai priest and a protege of Ryokan. Fellow samurai, jealous of Kingo, saw a chance to disgrace him in the eyes of his lord and reported falsely to Lord Emma that Kingo was forcibly dis uh, uh, disrupted the debate. This led Lord Emma to threaten to confiscate uh, Kingo's fief. Uh, Nichiren drafted a petition to Lord Emma on behalf of Shijo Kingo, which he sent to his loyal disciple before long. Lord Emma fell ill and eventually had to ask Shijo Kingo for treatment. He recovered under Kingo's care and thereafter placed renewed trust in him. In, him. in 1278, Kingo received uh, uh, from Emma another estate three times larger than his original one. When Nichiren became ill in his later years, Shijo Kingo attended him to... Uh, at, to him at Minobu. Kingo also attended Nichiren at, on his deathbed and participated in his funeral. After Nichiren's death, he lived in retirement at uh, Utsubuna uh, Utsu in Kai province. He lived for another 18 years, happily ever after, frankly speaking, okay? Just as we all have the capacity to, if we can endure long enough to attain Buddha in our present form. Okay, so that's... Shijo Kingo, but you can see he was there from the beginning, through Sado Island, through Tatsunakuchi persecution. He did Shakabuku. He took the, the Daishonin's advice and tried to Shakabuku people, tried to Shakabuku his, his, uh, his lord, uh, and then actually supported the Daishonin all the way to the, the point of his death. Um, I then wanted to read substituting faith for wisdom because this is absolutely part of the process that is, uh, uh, you know earthly desires are enlightenment because basically you're always utilizing your faith in the gohonzon to create advancement in your life right okay but do you always have the ability to perceive accurately and naturally the tenth world not really okay and wisdom when they're talking about wisdom we're talking about tenth world wisdom not just smart i know what 356 divided by 88 is without, okay, that's not that kind of wisdom. So substituting faith for wisdom, the principle that faith is the true cause to gain, for gaining supreme wisdom, and faith alone leads to enlightenment. So this is the other reason I wanted to mention this to Mr. Lee. None of what I'm going to discuss tonight or that this Go Show discusses happens without faith in the teaching. If you're going to go about looking at it academically, mm -hmm. you're not going to achieve the answer to the question you've actually asked, okay? So the question that you've asked and that I'm answering, I'm answering on the basis of faith, okay? If you want to understand it, you have to incorporate that same aspect into your life as it's delineated very clearly. This is not a mystery on how to do this. The difference between most of me and most of the other people I know that started when I did is that I just never gave up. All of the rest of them did give up. Almost all of them. Many, 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 many of them. It's very, very difficult. Okay? So, substituting faith for wisdom. The principle that faith is the true cause for gaining supreme wisdom, and faith alone leads to enlightenment. In general, Buddhism describes supreme wisdom as the cause for enlightenment. According to Lotus Sutra, however, even Shariputra, who was revered as the foremost in wisdom, could attain enlightenment only through faith, not through wisdom. The simple, sim, simile and parable third chapter of the sutra states, even you, Shariputra, in the case of this sutra, were able to gain entrance through faith alone. How much more so than the other voice hearers? The other, uh, the other pardon me, the other voice hears, it is because they have faith in the Buddha's words that they can comply with this sutra, not because of any <coughs> wisdom of their own. In great concentration and insight, Tiantai says, Buddhism is like the ocean that is like an ocean that one can only enter with faith. In 1277, treatise on the four stages of faith, five stages of practice, Nichiren states, because our wisdom is inadequate, he, Shakyamuni Buddha, teaches us to substitute faith for wisdom, making this single word faith the foundation. So once again, the point that I'm trying to make is that in my own experience, as far as attainment of uh, you know, earthly desires equal enlightenment, the attainment of Buddhahood in one's present form can only achieve 
with absolute faith in the teaching that leads you to be able to accomplish that. If you have doubts about that teaching, you must overcome those doubts first. That's why it's earthly desires. Earthly desires benefit, 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 benefit over year after year, decade after decade. Your mind starts to actually conform and accept the reality of the teaching as not something that's uh, theoretical, right. but that's actual. And it's only until you embrace the teaching as actual mm -hmm. and not theoretical can you perceive the truth of the teaching and have the benefit of, it, of its influence as a result. So the last thing here out of this copy was um, suffering. Okay, sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. Uh, Buddhism describes various categories of suffering, such as the four sufferings, the eight sufferings. The Sanskrit script term uh, dukkha uh, is rendered as suffering. It also means uneasiness, pain, sorrow, trouble, or difficulty. Shakyamuni's renunciation of the world, the quest for enlightenment, was motivated by a desire to find a solution to the four sufferings of birth, old age, uh, birth, aging, sickness, and death. First, the, uh, the first of the four noble truths which Shakyamuni is said to have taught to his, in his first sermon after attaining enlightenment is the truth of suffering, the truth that all existence is suffering. This, thus, the seeking and attaining of the way of release from suffering became the object of Buddhist practice. The doctrine that all existence is suffering cons, uh, constitutes one of the four Dharma seals and the four basic identifying principles of Buddhism. The other three are that all existence in it is impermanent, that nothing has, in it, uh, has uh, independent existence of its own, and the nirvana enlightenment is tranquil and quiet. All right? So then, going from there to here, and then I'll be reading the Gosha. This was the attainment of Buddhahood. To become a Buddha, several of the disciples, uh, several principles uh, concerning the attainment of Buddhahood or, the, or enlightenment have been expounded on the basis of the sutras. One, the attain, attainment of Buddhahood in one's present form. This means to attain Buddhahood just as one is without discarding the body of an ordinary person, also referred to as attaining Buddhahood as an ordinary person. This principle was formulated by the Tentai school on the basis of the Lotus Sutra. According to many of the teachings other than the Lotus Sutra, one can, can attain Buddhahood only after discarding the body of an ordinary person that gives rise to earthly desires and illusions. In contrast, the Lotus Sutra teaches that one can attain Buddhahood in one's present form or as an ordinary person. This principle is often illustrated by the example of the Dragon King's daughter who, according to the Devadatta chapter, attained Buddhahood in a single moment without changing her dragon form. The concept of attaining Buddhahood through transformation uh, the concept of attaining Buddhahood in one's present form contrasts with that of attaining Buddhahood through transformation of sex and character. The latter means, for example, that a woman must be reborn as a man in order to attain enlightenment. Okay? Two, attaining Buddhahood in this lifetime or in a single lifetime. This concept contradicts the idea that one must carry out austere practices over a period of many kalpas in order to attain Buddhahood. This concept is essentially the same as attaining Buddhahood in one's present form. Other principles concerning the attainment of Buddhahood by certain categories of people and derive, and, and derive from the Lotus Sutra per se, attainment of Buddhahood by persons of the two vehicles because they have been told they couldn't. The Lotus Sutra says they can. The first half of the Lotus Sutra's person, the two vehicles, voice hearers and cause awakened ones, receive a prophecy of, uh, from Shakyamuni that they will attain Buddhahood in future ages. This prophecy refutes the view that, of the provisional Mahayana teachings, which deny persons of the two vehicles attaining Buddhahood or, or on the attainment of Buddhahood, for they seek only personal salvation and do not strive to save others. The Lotus Sutra says that they will practice the Bodhisattva way and attain Buddhahood. The, the attainment of Buddhahood by women also discussed it and revealed in the Lotus Sutra, and the attainment of Buddhahood by evil persons, also discussed and first illustrated in the, in the Lotus Sutra. That's where he talks about Devadatta, mm -hmm. okay, like the shadow in form. Uh, then um, going on to Buddhahood, the state of awakening that a Buddha has attained, the ultimate goal of Buddha's practice, and the highest of the ten worlds. The, world, the word enlightenment is often used synonymously with Buddhahood. Buddhahood is regarded as a state of perfect freedom in which one is awakened to the eternal and ultimate truth that is the reality of all things. 
This supreme state of life is characterized by boundless wisdom and infinite compassion. The Lotus Sutra reveals that Buddhahood is a potential in the lives of all living beings. Also, look, uh, and then uh, you can also look up attainment of Buddhahood, which is what I had back here. But it's okay. Earthly, and then earthly desires are enlightenment. And I'm ready to, and I've got one more after that. Earthly, the Mahayana principle, now that's, that's again, earthly desires are enlightenment. A Mahayana principle based on the view that earthly desires cannot exist independently on their own, therefore one can attain enlightenment without eliminating earthly desires. This contrasts with the Hinayana view that extinguishing earthly desires is a prerequisite for enlightenment. According to the Hinayana teachings, earthly desires and enlightenment are not two independent and opposing factors, and the two cannot coexist. While the Mahayana teachings reveal that earthly desires are one with and inseparable from enlightenment. This is because all things, even earthly desires and enlightenment, are manifestations of the unchanging reality or truth, and thus non-dual at their source. The Universal Worthy Sutra, an epilogue to the, an epilogue to the Lotus Sutra states whether without kind of either cutting off earthly desires or separating themselves from the five desires, they can purify all their senses and wipe away all their offenses. Tentai says in great concentration and insight, the ignorance and dust of desires are enlightenment and the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. In the record of the orally transmitted teachings, Nietzsche states the idea of gradually, over, gradually overcoming delusions is not the ultimate meaning of the lifespan chapter of the Lotus Sutra. You should understand that the ultimate meaning of this chapter is that ordinary mortals, just as they are in their original state of being, are Buddhas. And today, when Nietzsche and his followers recite the words Nam Myoho Rengekyo, they are burning the firewood of earthly desires, summoning up the wisdom fire, and summoning up the wisdom fire of enlightenment. And then I was going to get into the precept of the diamond chalice, and I don't, and the simultaneity of cause and effect, I don't really think I have to explain, because that's actually what this is all going to boil down to. So let me now, that I've read all that preliminarily, let me get into the Go Show. It's on page... Uh, 317, it's very short, and this should all work out. But what I just said, I should still give, be able to give my explanation. Before I start reading this Go Show, though, this is from President Nikita, from a, a new um, thing that he's putting out uh, called, that it's called the Buddhism of the Sun. He says, people with an invincible spirit are never pessimistic, even when things don't go as they hoped. Mr. Toto once said to some young women's division members, you should be proud that you possess within you the same life state as Nietzsche and Daishonin. Maintain a noble spirit and triumph in life. Never belittle yourselves. Nietzsche and Buddhism enables us to confidently overcome life's problems without becoming discouraged, feeling sorry for ourselves, or thinking, I'm no good, or I can't do it. The power of the mystic law enables us to decisively vanquish the fundamental darkness or ignorance that tries to diminish our supremely noble lives. He goes on to say, the Daishonin goes so far as to say that if we seek the law outside ourselves, we will not attain Buddhahood no matter how much we chant. Instead, our practice will become an endless painful austerity. Seeking the law outside ourselves means looking for the causes and effects of happiness and misfortune outside our own lives. This includes shifting responsibility or blame to other people or circumstances. It also refers to the doubt that arises when some, something terrible and unexpected happens, causing us to waver in faith, become fearful, bemoan our situation, or feel resentful to others. Faith in the Daishonin's Buddhism begins from awakening to the fact that the great state of the Buddha, uh, the great life state of the Buddha exists within each one of us. We are Buddhas, exactly as we are. As such, Nichiren Buddhism is not de a dependent faith in which our prayers are an appeal to some external power for help. It is a struggle to believe in our own potential and manifest our inherent Buddhahood. This is why the Daishonin states, strengthen your faith day by day and month after month. Chanting nam myoho renge is a battle against darkness or ignorance that shrouds the truth that we ourselves are Buddhists. That's why it requires serious dedication. Through chanting, 
Daimoku, we can conquer our doubts and break through the shell of our lesser self. nam myoho is the fundamental power that can transform even sorrow into a wellspring of creativity. All right, now, starting on page 317. Did everybody understand what he just said? He just said what's going to be discussed right here. All right, mm -hmm. this is the ghost, just starting on page 317. I deeply... Earthly desires are enlightenment. <clears throat> and I'm going to read the background at the end instead of at the beginning. I deeply appreciate your visit here and your constant concern over the numerous persecutions that have befallen me. I do not regret meeting with such great persecutions as the votary of the Lotus Sutra. However many times I were, I were to repeat the cycle of birth and death, no life could be as fortunate as this. If not for these troubles, I might have remained in the three or four evil paths. But now, to my great joy, I am sure to sever the cycle of the sufferings of birth and death and attain the fruit of Buddhahood. Even for spreading the teachings of the theoretical 3,000 realms in a single moment of life from the first half of the Lotus Sutra, Tintai and Dingyo met with hatred and jealousy. In Japan, it was transmitted from Dingyo to Gishin, Incho, Jikaku, and others, and spread. The 18th chief priest of the Tendai school was the great teacher Jie. He had, and he had many disciples. Among them, there were four named Dana, Eshin, Sogo, and Zinyu. The teachings were also divided into two. The administrator of priest Dana transmitted the doctrinal studies while the supervisor of priest Eshin studied the meditative practices. Thus, the doctrinal studies and meditative practices are like the sun and moon. Doctrinal studies are shallow while meditative practices are deep. Thus, the teaching expounded by Dana is broad but shallow, while the teaching of Eshin is limited but deep. Though the teaching I am now propagating, which is the Buddhas and the sowing, nam myoho though the teaching I am now propagating seems, li propagating seems limited, just chant nam myoho Rengekyo, that's pretty <coughs> brief, right? Mm -hmm. It seems limited, it is extremely profound. That is because it goes deeper than the teaching expounded by Tentai, Dengyo, and others. It is the three important matters in the lifespan chapter of the essential teaching, you know, the three great secret laws. Mm -hmm. Practicing only the seven characters of nam myoho Rengekyo seems limited, but since they are the master of all the Buddhas of the three existences, the teacher of all the bodhisattvas in the ten directions and the guide that enables all living beings to attain the Buddha way, it is profound. The sutra states, now he just qualified, he just stated, that's the way it is. Okay? That's, that's what he's stating is his teaching. The sutra states, the wisdom of the Buddha, of the Buddhas, is infinitely profound and immeasurable. It refers to the Buddhas, plural here, in the sense of all Buddhas throughout the ten directions in the three existences, from the thus come one Mahavrachana of the true word school and Amida of the pure land school to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of all schools and all sutras, all Buddhas of the past, present, and future, and, all, and the present, thus come one Shakyamuni. And the sutra speaks of the wisdom of all those Buddhas. That's the wisdom that we're trying to seek. Right? That's what enlightenment in your present form is all about. That same wisdom. Mm. All right? What is meant by this wisdom? It is the entity. Catch this when he says it. It is the entity of the true aspect of all phenomena and of the ten factors of life that led all beings to Buddhahood. It is the, let me say that again, So, because these are just words. You have to catch what he's saying. What is meant by this wisdom? It is the entity of the true aspect of all phenomena and of the ten factors of life that lead all beings to Buddhahood. What then is that entity? It is nam myoho kyo A commentary states that the profound principle of the true aspect is the originally inherent myoho kyo we learn that the true aspect of all phenomena is also the two Buddha Shakyamuni and many treasures seated together in the treasure tower. All phenomena corresponds to many treasures and the, and the true aspect corresponds to Shakyamuni. These are the two elements of reality and wisdom. Kyochi Myogo, right? Mm -hmm. Many treasures is reality, Shakyamuni is wisdom. It is the enlightenment that reality and wisdom are two and yet they are not two. And the wisdom, we're talking about Buddha wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. So reality and Buddha wisdom 
seem to be two, but they are not. They are not, they are, they are not two. These are teachings of prime importance. They are also what is called earthly desires are enlightenment. So if you understand this teaching with your life, you've achieved Buddhahood. And the suffering, so he says, these are teachings of prime importance. These are also called what is called earthly desires are enlightenment and the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. Ch chanting nam myoho renge -kyo during the physical union of man and woman is indeed what is called earthly desires are enlightenment. And the sufferings of birth and of death and nirvana are nirvana. The sufferings of birth and death are nirvana exist only in realizing that the entity of life throughout its cycle of birth and death is neither born nor destroyed. The universal worthy sutra states without either cutting off earthly desires or separating themselves from the five desires, they can purify all their senses and wipe away all their offenses. Great concentration and insight says the ignorance and dust of desires are enlightenment and the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. The Lifespan chapter of Lotus Sutra says, At all times I think to myself, how can I cause living beings to gain entry into the unsurpassed way and quickly acquire the body of a Buddha? The Expedient Means chapter says, The characteristics of the world are constantly abiding. Surely such statements refer to these principles. Thus, what is called the entity is none other than nam myoho renge -kyo. It was such an august and precious Lotus Sutra that in past existences I put under my knees, despised, scowled upon, in disgust, and failed to believe in. In one way or another, I maliciously ridiculed those who, studying the teachings of the Lotus Sutra, taught them to even one person and carried on the life of the law. In addition, I did everything I could to hinder people from embracing the sutra by asserting that they should set aside for a while, set it aside for a while because though it might be suitable for practice in their next lifetime, it would be too difficult to practice in this one. Slanderous acts such as these have brought on the many severe persecutions I suffer in my lifetime. Because I once disparaged the Lotus Sutra, the highest form of all sutras I am now looked down upon, and my words go unheeded. The simile and parable chapter states that other people will neither concern themselves with nor have sympathy for one, even though one sincerely tries to be friendly with them. Nevertheless, you, you, even though I'm all that, Shijo Kingo, nevertheless, you became a votary of the Lotus Sutra. And as a result, you suffered persecutions just like I have. And you came to my assistance. In the Teacher of the Law chapter, the Buddha states that he will magically conjure and send the four, kind of belie four kinds of believers, monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen, for the sake of the teachers of the law. If the layman mentioned here does not mean you, who does it refer to? You have not only heard the law, but have taken faith in it, and since then have followed it without turning aside. How wondrous, how extraordinary. If that is the case, then can there be any doubt that I am the teacher of the law of the Lotus Sutra? Perhaps I, am all, perhaps I also resemble the envoy of the thus come one, for I am carrying out the thus come one's work. I have nearly spread the five char characters of the Daimoku that were entrusted to Bodhisattva superior practices when the two Buddhas were seated together within the treasure tower. Does this not mean that I am an envoy of the Bodhisattva superior practices? Moreover, following me, you, as a votary of the Lotus Sutra, have told others of this law. What else could this be but the transmission of the law? Carry through with your faith in the Lotus Sutra. You cannot strike fire from flint if you stop halfway. Bring forth the great power of faith and be spoken of by all the people of Kamakura, both high and low, or by all the people of Japan as Shijo Kingo, Shijo Kingo of the Lotus Sutra, Sutra, pardon me, of the Lotus School. Even a bad reputation will spread far and wide. A good reputation will spread even farther, particularly if it is a reputation for devotion to the Lotus Sutra. Explain all of this to your wife too and work together like the sun and moon, a pair of eyes or the two wings of a bird. With the sun and moon, could there be a path to darkness? Uh, could there be a path of darkness? With a pair of eyes, no doubt, you will see the face, faces of Shakyamuni, many treasures, and the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. With a pair of wings, will you, you will surely fly in an instant to the treasure land of tranquil light. I will write more in detail on another occasion with my deep respect, Nichiren, second day of the fifth month, reply to Shijo Kingo. Background, page 319. Volume 1 of the Writings of Nietzsche and Daishonin. In the fourth month of the ninth year of Brunei, Shijo Kingo traveled from Kamakura to Sato Island to visit Nietzsche and Daishonin. 
Kinga was, samurai, was a samurai who served the Emma family, a branch of the ruling Hojo clan. The journey to Sado was long, a, a long and arduous one involving a boat trip across the Sea of Japan and required that he be absent himself from his duties in Kamakura for more than a month. In the fifth month of the same year, soon after Shijo Kingo returned to Kamakura, Nichiren Daishon is sent in this letter. It was written in gratitude for the samurai's visit. In the letter, the Daishonin explains the power of Namyoho Rengeko in terms of such profound Buddhist principles as the fusion of reality and wisdom and earthly desires are enlightenment. Although Hinayana Buddhism teaches that earthly desires must be eliminated to attain enlightenment, Mahayana, and particularly Lotus Sutra, teaches that earthly desires are one with and inseparable from enlightenment. The reason is that both are the workings or expression of life itself and thus are the same in their source. Nietzsche and Daishonin teaches that when one bases one's life on nam myoho rengeko earthly desires work naturally for one's own and others' happiness. The great power of nam myoho rengeko which is inherently positive and creative, directs the great energy of one's earthly desires toward happiness and value for all. Thus, when one chants the Daimoku, earthly desires are enlightenment. Near his, until his near execution at Tatsunokuchi in the ninth month of 1271, the Daishonin had assumed the role of Bodhisattva superior practices, the votary of whose appearance is predicted in the Lotus Sutra. He had spent all his time teaching the essence of the Sutra and propagating the faith. After Tatsunokuchi, he revealed his true identity as the Buddha who is one with the supreme law of Nam Myoho Rengekyo, which would make him the entity. In this letter, the Daishonin teaches the significance of the Daimoku from the standpoint of the Buddha who opens the way to Buddhahood for all humankind. That's who he is. That's the point. Right. But by making them equal to himself, not by retaining a position of superiority over them. Right. Do you understand? Yes. By making them all Buddhas just like him so they can do the same thing he's done. Right. All right? He first states that it is his great joy to meet persecutions as a votary of the Lotus Sutra, because it is the sure way to attain Buddhahood. Though the, te through the, te though the teachings I am now propagating seem limited, it is, it, they, it is extremely profound. That is because it goes deeper than the teachings expounded by Tentai, Dengyo, and others, who reveals that the ultimate law of all Buddhas is none other than nam myoho Rengekyo. So, now, getting into Mr. Lee's specific question to me, because that gave the literal explanation, but now I want to give a life-based explanation of earthly desires or enlightenment. Because my practice is different than many or most people's practice in that I chanted for so long and received such profound benefit before I even knew what nam myoho Rengekyo meant. I did it on the basis of faith of trying it once and before I could finish re saying the words three times what I was asking for happened. And then again, and then again, and then seemingly for a period of almost several years, mm -hmm. no matter what I prayed for, happened, okay? So I was always um, somebody that didn't have to be convinced from that very first meeting, okay, uh, that that the Gohonzon had power, that there was something to this nam myoho Rengekyo. And then as a result of finding out where nam myoho Rengekyo actually came from, what it meant, what the background was, I immediately said, okay, this is it. So from the perspective of my practice, I started doing shakabuku like before I had even received Gohonzon. Okay, I started doing shakabuku uh, before I even knew what nam myoho Rengekyo meant because my friend had told me these words and I couldn't explain them, but I would tell people you should, these words are incredible, okay? Mm -hmm. So the experience that I had that I want to share with, with uh, Mr. Lee and everyone else that I think you've all heard is this experience I had with the grunion, okay? Well, I, had, I had chanted, I had changed everything so that I was no longer, you know, I'd, I'd become an assistant manager at the retail chain that I worked at. I'd become the youngest assistant manager that they'd, they'd ever had at 19. Uh, and uh, I eventually got transferred to a, a, another uh, location in town. That's why I ended up being there and being by myself. And that's where my friend walked in and said, hey, this girl just walked up to me and had this Nam Myoho card. But 
I ended up uh, going to uh, meetings from that first meeting on and immediately started to give experiences because I was having experiences from chanting. And so when they would get to the point, does anybody have an experience or something, I would jump up every time, even though I had not yet been able to go to the temple to get Gohonza. And the key is that uh, the experience that I had with trying to tell my friends about Nam Myoho Rengekyo was really substantiated not to them, but to myself by virtue of the experience that I had from trying to tell them about Nam Myoho Rengekyo. And this is an experience where I had I'd only been practicing, at, when I say practicing, now I had, uh, I had, I had started to chant Daimoku, I was going to activities, I still did not have Gohonzon because I couldn't receive Gohonzon, I couldn't get off on the Sunday necessary to go to a Gokai ceremony to, to receive it. So at any rate, I got invited by my friends to go hunt grunion. And if anybody lives on the West Coast, you know grunion are little fish that come up and mate on the sand, and then the waves come up and wash them back out to sea, and you got to catch them by hand for it to be legal and all that stuff. So I had been invited to come back to the, the place where I had been living and go hang out with my old hippie friends, and we were going to go party. We were going to go grunion hunting, all right? The grunion only, this, these little fish only come when the, it's, it's very, um, uh, the, the, the full moon is out, all right? So it's a very specific time. It's once a month, only during the summer. I decided to hitchhike, do my hitchhiking thing again. I haven't been uh, hitchhiking to chant or, or chanting to hitchhike. I immediately think, oh, yeah, let me chant, you know, and immediately I get a ride. The guy goes 100 miles an hour, way faster than the speed limit, almost scarily. I get out. I get another ride, another very fast ride. The third ride is there from a bunch of hippies. And a friend of mine that had, was hitchhiking from a place that was much, much closer than me all the way up in San Bernardino, I got there where we were all gonna meet before then. And by the time I got done with all those rides from Channing, I was like, I gotta tell all my friends about Nam Myoho Rengekyo. So as I tried to explain it to them and they were all looking at me like I was a crazed lunatic. <laughs> I started behaving like a crazy lunatic by saying, I'll prove it to you. Because I love these dudes. These were all my best friends. And I could understand that they couldn't grasp what I was saying so easily. I said, I'll prove it to you. I'm going to chant right now, and tonight we're going to get more grunion than we've ever gotten. I'll show you. I'll prove it to you. So all the way down to the beach, you know, we're in my friend's station wagon, you know, four hippie kids, all long hair. I mean, at this point in time, I have hair down the hair still. And, uh, you know, we, we get down to the beach and we're hunting the grunion. Well, the way you go, you hunt grunion is you go into the water and you face the beach, you know, so the, so the wave comes in and go out, the, the fish get, they're flopping around, yeah. you run up and you grab them. And this happened to be a night where everybody was out for the grunion, mm -hmm. right? So you could only get like arm length apart from the next person next to you. So there's a lot of competition for those fish. And I chanted in front of my friends, like I thought I was like some, you know, Buddhist <laughs> priest, like, you know, had like a, a lotus <laughs> position in the back seat of the, of the van while I chanted very deep, sincere Daimoku like I was some sort of a heavyweight dude, right? Nam yo ho kyo And they would all laugh and look at me like, you wait, you wait, 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 wait for those grinding, and I'm going to prove it to you. Nam yo ho So I was going in, I, doing my best imitation of what I thought it was to be religiously deep. And... So uh, we get there, and we've gone through this, and uh, you know, you would have you you come down with a bucket to throw the fish in and stuff. Uh -huh. And as we and I'm, I'm I'm in the water, and I don't care that there are people right next to me. I'm chanting Nam Myoho Rengeki. I'm going to convert the whole world tonight. <laughs> you know, everybody that can hear me, no Nam Myoho Rengeki, right? So I'm getting some strange looks, but then when the fish come, every time there would be a wave where the fish you I'd run over, they'd slip out of my hand or something, and then the next wave would come and they'd be gone. And, and like, everybody's getting fish but me. Just the opposite of what I said, okay? I'm the one that's looking like a doofus, okay? And as the tide starts to go out, as the evening go, wears on, and I'm just still faith, I'm going, I know something's going to happen. Something's going to happen so that I can prove the power of the law. And all that time, all I'm chanting for is not for the fish, I'm chanting to show my friends that I'm not full of shit. Mm. This Nam Myoho Rengekyo is real. I'm trying to get them to try chanting. Mm. Right. 
and I'm just really bumming out because I feel like I'm letting down mm. Nam Yoho Rengekyo. Somehow I shouldn't have opened my mouth and promised <laughs> something that I can't deliver here, obviously. So I continued. The, and as, as the night went on and the tide goes out and the fish quit running with the regularity, people get bored, they go home, right? So now the, the people that I'm competing for the fish with are getting less and less and less. But the tide is going out more and more, and I'm never still not giving up. I'm chanting. My friends have gotten bucketfuls already. They've already gotten all the fish that we need for all of us to eat that night. And finally, one of them comes, because I look like a really pathetic person at this point in time. You know, There's nobody left in the water. I'm out there by myself, almost with tears in my eyes. Nom yo ho yo Nom yo yo So he finally comes out, and he goes, he goes, dude, come on. Come on, you've got to catch cold. He says, I'm sure it works most of the time. I'm sure it almost always works. Just please stop. Mm -hmm. And so we had brought like a grill, and we were going to do the campfire. We are going to cook the fish right there and eat them right there. One of, my, one of the dudes played the guitar, you know, and so right. he's sitting there playing the guitar, mm -hmm. and, you know, two guys are talking while they're cleaning fish, and I'm sitting there just pondering, why didn't it work? Why didn't it work? It always works. It always works. You know, go on, you know, why would you embarrass me like this? I put it all out there for my friends. I'm doing the Buddhist thing. I'm doing the Bodhisattva of the earth thing here. You know, I'm doing like you. I'm, I'm telling people I don't give a shit what they say. They think I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. And I'm totally not bummed out, but just how could this be? How could this be? Why would, I, why would I have put myself in this situation and had this happen? And this is again, now at this point in time, the, my, my, the people back in San Bernardino are saying, you've got to get a Gohan on time. I'm going, I really would like to, but I can't, you know, my, my, my boss won't let me off on Sunday to do it. But I'm still gung-ho and I'm still going to the meetings. I just chant like I've always been chanting. I didn't have a Gohan on. I had a, had a Hootsadon, but no Gohan on it. So we're all sitting there, two friends are talking, one's playing the guitar, I'm completely morose, deep in thought, and it, the, the, it's a full moon, because the fish only come out at the full moon. Mm -hmm. So you can see everything so brightly under that full moon. And uh, I see two guys walking down the beach, and I've just been kind of like gazing at them, they're walking along the water, right? And we're up off of the water while we're doing our campfire thing. And I'm still thinking, I'm just watching them all of a sudden, those guys start screaming. Go, whoa, wow, ah, whoa, oh, ha, what? And my friends are all going, uh, I go, like, what's the matter with them? And I immediately, you know, I jumped up, I couldn't see what was happening, but I could see from their reaction and something just, I was gonna start crying telling this story, I'll try not to. All of a sudden, I, I just jump up and I go, Grunion! <laughs> So I run down to where they are, and a freak of nature had happened. Because I've gone grunion hunting many times, mm -hmm. being a Southern California kid, and they never land in a, in a pile of fish flopping around mating bigger than this around. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I run down to the beach, and each wave is, each wave is still going out mm -hmm. further, right? The, the tide is still going out, so that the the beach is like this, and then when it, it starts to get steep, when it starts, right? So what has happened is the reason that these two guys are going crazy is there are millions and possibly billions of grunion that have all come up on the beach at the same time, okay? So many that when I ran toward the water, they could hear the noise, they could feel, and all of them started flipping, and it created this thunder a thunderous sound, and as far as I could see in both directions, there was nothing but millions, possibly billions of grunion fish shimmering in the moonlight on their bellies, on their sides, and I just went like this. I just went, Nam yo holding geiko, and I would just was able to just scrape up, you know, I, I grabbed my bucket when I went down there, I said, Nam yo holding geiko, I went down there, grabbed up two scoops, and my bucket was full. Now I'm in tears, and I'm just like looking up at the sky. Like, this is a religious experience mm -hmm. akin to seeing God or something, frankly speaking. Because at that point in time, I was done. I knew Nam Yoho Rengekyo was real. 
there was no doubt it was real. There, were, there was no doubt that whoever this Nietzsche and Daishonin dude was, he was the real deal. Okay? So, even though my friends were not able to be converted that night, even seeing the Grunion thing, at least I didn't look like an asshole. They all laughed and said, hey, good job. You know? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't actually understand it. But the point is that, you know, in, in, in also having a circumstance where I had chanted for so long for so many things before I actually found out that this was Nietzsche and Buddhism or the SGI, you can imagine the kinds of things I chanted for and I got them all. I mean, you talk about sex, drugs, and rock and roll? <laughs> All of it. Okay? So this was a different kind of thing for me because actually, again, earthly desires is what I was constantly pursuing without limitation. Okay? There was no moral framework for you can chant for this because it's good and you can't chant for this because it's bad. Okay? So... From my experience, I was able to ascertain that I could chant for anything. I didn't really feel like that. Then when I started getting around Nietzsche and Shoshu, they had a lot of actual moral parameters. Right. Right. Okay? That had not been my experience with the Gohans. I had chanted for stuff that they were saying, you know, well, well then what, why did I get the benefit then? <laughs> what am I supposed to be being taught by the Gohansa? <laughs> you know? So this earthly desire is equal enlightenment was always a very important concept for me because it's what I did. I figured as long as I continue to chant for my earthly desires to be fulfilled, I'll eventually attain Buddhahood. And so, Mr. Lee, that's what it really means to me. You know, everybody that starts practicing, starts practicing for the most part because Nam Myoho Rengeku is one of the few influences on life that can show you a kind of power that you can't deny. And so you have the ability to actually pray for things to change or be different, and you see the influence and the power of that prayer. Now, I'm not saying that, that the Nam Myoho Rengeku is the only thing that ever delivers or answered prayer, because many people will talk about they prayed from this belief set or this belief set or this belief set, and their prayers were answered. But those prayers are not ever answered in a manifest way that ultimately leads to you perceiving the truth that your prayers are being answered by you. Okay? They're always, those kinds of prayers always lead you to continue to be dependent. As President Nikita was just, as I was just going through the dictionary, dependent kind of a prayer where you're relying on some outside influence outside of yourself. Okay? So, Earthly desires are enlightenment is the reality that it's through accommodating the needs in our life, okay? Earthly desires don't necessarily mean sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It can mean an adequate place to live. It can mean food to eat. It can mean overcoming a terrible uh, uh, illness or physical liability. It can mean each individual has a different karma. I just happen to be a hippie, okay? None of you guys were hippies, all right? So it's it's it's... To each individual, you know, what will be the stimulus or the catalyst for your faith? The point is that if you never give up, you'll go through the process of living the same life as Nietzsche and Daishonin if you can finally gain the wisdom to realizing that, that the Go Show is just describing the reality of life as, a fa as a, a, the faith of a practitioner. That's really all it is. We're emulating the life of Nietzsche and Daishonin. Daishonin. We're living the same type of life as Nietzsche and Daishonin. We're attaining the same state of life as Nietzsche and Daishonin. This is, none of this is over our head. So when you ask me, I want to hear it from you. What are earthly, earthly desires and enlightenment? What does that mean? It means that when I first started practicing 46 years ago, almost 46 years ago, I chanted about one thing for one kind of thing. And as I got all of those prayers answered, and I still found myself in want, I began to then start praying for a different kind of prayer, trying to understand what the hell is going on. Mm -hmm. Why? Okay? I know it works, but this is happening, or these things keep happening. Okay? So rather than... In, and, and my rejection was I, I was b raised in a very Christian, fundamental kind of background. And so one of the reasons why I had rejected that kind of thing is I saw so much hypocrisy in it, and I saw such a level of impossibility in it. I did not see anybody that actually was affected in a way, in my life anyhow, 
that showed me that the words and the reality were the same. In Buddhism, I found that the re words and the reality are the same, always completely the same, because they're constantly adjustable and in keeping with who, who you are at this moment. And who you are at this moment is not who you will be in another moment. And as you continue to advance by chanting, you're chanting all the time for stuff. Maybe that is why people start chanting, but it isn't why people continue to chant. Mm -hmm. Because people that continue to just chant for stuff quit chanting. Okay? The practice is set up that way, to work that way. You don't keep getting what you want if all you chant for is stuff. You're forced to start asking, why am I getting less benefit? I need to chant more Daimoku. Maybe I need to study more. There are a lot of people that chant for a long time without ever reading or understanding the teaching. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened to me was because I went through such a miserable period and having the faith that I did, okay, I believe this has to be true, so now I got to figure out why I could be experiencing what I'm experiencing. That forced me to study and study and study. That's why I've read all these ghost shows so many times. It wasn't out of happiness. <laughs> it was some of the time as I was reading and sharing them with other people. But most of the time it was a, a contemplative process that was this earthly desires, our enlightenment, actualizing itself in the true process of the principle whereby eventually I realized the sixth stage of practice. So I'll leave tonight with going and finishing. Did I just move that? Yeah, I think I did. Am I still lined up? Let's just go back and, and read that again. The title of honor for one who is eternally endowed with the three bodies is Nam Yoho Rengekyo. You're all Nam Yoho Rengekyo, thus come once. This is, what is, uh, this, is, this is what the three great concerns of actuality of the lifespan chapter refer to, the three great secret laws, okay? Speaking in terms of the six stages of practice, the reality of your life as a calm, you know, in, living in the Sahe world. Uh, the thus come one in this chapter is an ordinary mortal who is in the first stage, that of being a Buddha in theory. That's everybody that's a living individual, okay, whether you chant or not. When one reverently accepts Nam Yoho Rengekyo, one is in the next stage, that of hearing the name and the words of the truth. That is, one has for the first time heard the Daimoku. Heard the Daimoku. That's all it takes. That's the catalyst that starts the, the next four, which we'll repeat in each lifetime. When having heard the Daimoku, one proceeds to put it into practice. This is the third stage, that of perception and action. In this stage, one perceives the object of devotion that embodies the 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. When one succeeds in overcoming various obstacles of illusions, this is the fourth stage, that of resemblance to enlightenment. That comes from while you progress in study and understanding the reality of your life. Uh, when one succeeds in overcoming various obstacles of illusion, this is the fourth stage, that of resemblance to enlightenment. When one sets out to convert others, this is the fifth stage, that of progressive awakening. And when one comes at last to the realization that one is a Buddha eternally endowed with the three bodies, then one is a Buddha of the sixth and highest stage, that of ultimate enlightenment. Speaking of the chapter as a whole, the idea of gradually overcoming illusions is not the ultimate meaning of the lifespan chapter. You should understand that the ultimate meaning of this chapter is that ordinary mortals, just as they are in their original state of being, are Buddhas. Okay? So, Mr. Lee, you are the Buddha. If you're thinking that it's not, that you're not good enough to be the Buddha or that there's some special state that you have to achieve in order to be the Buddha, I hope some point in time you try chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Just do what we're suggesting to do. You've already, you already know the basis, basic substance of the principles involved. Just try it. Try chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo and use earthly desires to achieve your enlightenment. Chant to see benefit. Chant to see power. Chant to see the things that will influence your nature to continue to strive to get to the goal that you're trying to achieve, and you'll do it in this lifetime. Don't think about, I've been practicing this many years, and so I say this shit. I say this because I went through everything that forced me to learn this. My wife didn't have to go through any of the stuff that I'm going through, and she knows everything I know. Okay, so there is no timeline limiting anyone as it relates to how old they are when they start, because you start with more life wisdom if you start old. It, you know, when I was 19, I was a dumbass, okay? This is all relative to you. Your 
reality, if you've met Nam Myoho Rengeko, is to become the Buddha in your present form. That's your mission. I really hope you'll try to achieve it. And thank you for that great question. That's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.